I was born in 52. So I was a child of the Brown versus Board of Education era, born here in Montgomery, totally segregated city, about 106,000 people in the population, 60% were black, 60% were white, excuse me, and 40% were black. Everything segregated. We know about the bus boycott with the segregation and bus ridership with Mrs. Rosa Parks in December 55. Schools were segregated, housing was segregated, there were segregated theaters, black people had the Pekin Theater, whites had the Empire. It was in front of the Empire Theater that Mrs. Parks was arrested. Um, taxi cabs, everything else was a totally segregated city and that included the parks and, and the pools throughout the city. The experience I'm going to describe is my experience with Oak Park, which, which was the main, like, like oasis in the middle of the city where white women would bring their their children that they were keeping to the park to exercise and to the pool to swim. Back then Oak Park was very, very beautiful, very well landscaped, pretty trees, pretty flowers. There was a pool there, zoo animals were there and everything. After Brown v. Board in 54, the Montgomery Council passed a law in 57 banning blacks from going to the parks and the pools. This is in 57. So we're taking a step backward, contrary to even what Supreme Court law was in 54. The city uh, wanted to get rid of as many of the civil rights people that they could get rid of at any means necessary. So uh, everyone knew the law, and you know how to survive within the law. You know, like when I was a little kid, when in Crescent Department, still in Pensacola, Florida, I was finna go to the White Water, found about four years old. My mother hit me upside the head to stop me because there were two white men. You know, black lives do matter, but black survival is more important. She'd rather have, I'd rather have Uncle Tom, a live teenager, than have a dead hero. We feel that education is the key uh, to freeing ourselves from the system of re-enslavement. Uh, imprisonment is the new re-enslavement. Uh, we got out of bondage in 1865. We are now being placed back into uh, bondage uh, through incarceration uh, due to the things that we talked about, uh, from drugs, illegal activity, fast money, which is enticing and inducing to someone who may not expect to make uh, a minimum wage. And I think that uh, the Equal Justice Initiative uh, Museum and Memorial uh, is an excellent place, a one that will provide information. Education is the key. And I think that with this education and with this information coming through the museum, coming through this memorial, uh, will help enlighten uh, the minds of our people and keep it in the forefront of everyone just what's going on. Uh, we need to remember, if we don't become aware and if we don't remember, we may repeat being re-enslaved again to the same type of process that's been uh, created. And so through those types of memorials and through those types of museums, uh, we have an excellent start. You want me to talk about comparing racism when I was growing up in the 50s to what it's like in 2017. Well, everything's the same, everything has changed. When President Obama was elected, there was talk about this being a post-racial society, that everything was equal now, that blacks and whites were equal, the playing fields had been leveled, and we were just this one melt, happy melting pot. We both know that that's absolutely not the case. Um, the, the numbers in terms of black income compared to white income, the numbers of blacks incarcerated uh, relative to our population is tremendous. EJI has the data on that, about how mass incarceration is another form of Jim Crow. Um, we look at educational change, achievement, um, job force security, all those areas, the different matrices of demographics, infant mortality, um, everything that you can measure a society by, our community falls many, many percentages below that level of whites. And I think one contributing factor to that is the whole reality of white skin privilege. Um, 
we, we don't want to talk about it, but I think privilege is something that has to be talked about when we, when we want to address inequities in society. Just on the basis of, of having white skin, our white brothers and sisters grow up, they wake up every morning with a sense of superiority, even, to, even if they don't think about it. They just breathe, I'm superior. Um, it's they inherited it from the wealth that their families accumulated off the backs of black people during slavery. It doesn't mean that they were slave owners themselves, but they inherited that privilege. So they got a better opportunity to go to college, a better opportunity to have good jobs, a better opportunity to live in better neighborhoods. Privilege that inured to them just simply on the basis of their skin color. And I think in order for us to talk about truly reconciling our relations in this country, we have to admit white skin privilege exists. We have to talk about racial history. That's why EJI's project on lynching is very important because it brings out truth about our country's past. And before we can have any real reconciliation between the races, we have to deal with truth. Um, Bishop Tutu led in South Africa after, after apartheid ended, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. And I think we need to have that kind of truth-telling experience here so that once we put, all, put it all out on the table, what black people have been subjected to, then we can have healing dialogues around that to push us to a new place in history. But without that truth and without that reconciliation, I think we're going to be doomed to staying in this wallowing in this melting pot that's not a not one of a blending of races but of total segregation and separation of races. Speaking from what is currently going on, we know that we were incarcerated and we have the world's largest population. And in fact, right now we have more people incarcerated in America than all of the other civilized countries combined in the world, and we are throwing in Russia and even China. That is uh, a very, very horrendous negative uh, here. Now, most of those, 50%, are blacks and Hispanics. Keep in mind that African Americans only make up about 12% of the population. Hispanics, somewhere between 14, 15% of the total population. Yet, and we are 50% of those locked up. Now, you see who is being targeted. Uh, when it comes to the incarceration, most of the people there are due to drugs. 85% of the illegal drugs used in this country are used by our good white Christian friends. 85 plus percent of the people incarcerated are black people and Hispanics. Do the math, take a look at the reality of that. The mass incarceration is, is a byproduct of, of a system. See, and all the, when they incarcerate you in the prison, they uh, they don't they do not study your background. They don't concern all they're concerned with you violated a, a made a, a crime. Then you can be incarcerated. But then black people are disproportionate to then in other ethnic groups. For the man that was running through the park, the man shot him six or seven times in the back. But I never have seen a black a white. Uh, blonde be shot even in the front. You know, the man, so anytime a, a system will shoot a man running from you, well, that's a bad system, bro. Don't you let nobody fool. Racism still exists. We, we kind of filter it out, but after we've gone through something for 300 years, they can't filter it out. Only thing they can do is be a more, more and more jails. Like the state of Alabama now kind of float a bond to build an $800 million prison. So all that kind of goes together on a on human level.